So far in this class, when we talk about sequence stratigraphy, we focused on the T factory. Let's have a look now at the M factory. We're back in the Oman mountain. We are in the Jebel Akdar tectonic window and the rocks around me you can see are pitch dark. They're really black. And these are Neoproterozoic limestone. I have mentioned those limestone before when we were in Wadi Bani Kharuz and now we actually have the whole sequence behind us. These Neoproterozoic limestone were formed before skeletons were invented. They are microbial carbonates and we'll, we'll have an opportunity to look at them closer. But the goal of this class is to introduce you to the sequence stratigraphy of carbonate mud mounds and the M factory in general. So before we start looking at the Omani example, let's go back to the US and New Mexico where we have spectacular examples of mud mound structure. So here I'm showing you an example of a mud mound out the outcrop. This is a famous carbonate mound known as Mulshu Mound. And Mulshu Mound is very easy to access. And you can see this characteristic um, mound-shaped geometry here. So we'll look at Mulshu Mound in more details. But by and large, when you look at the M factory in terms of mud mound, mud mounds are isolated mounds that can grow typically very deep maybe 200 meters, 100 meters, maybe 500 meters of water depth. So they're very, very deep, which means that base level really doesn't impact them that much. So there's not much sequence stratigraphy to be done on mud mound, with the exception that, as you can see here at Mulshu Mound, the top of the mound is flattened. <clears throat> what does that mean when, when something's flattened? It means that sediments were washed away from this area. So that implies some form of energy, wave energy or current energy. We think for the mud mound that it's essentially currents, that at some point the mud mound grew into the area of maximum current and that limited its growth vertically. It could only grow laterally. So in that sense, it's a bit like a sequence stratigraphic model. But by and large, mud mound form geometries that are mounded, as their name indicates. You can either have mud mounds that don't have flanks, so we, we distinguish between the core and the flank of a mud mound. The core is typically the part that is muddy, that is mechritic rich, and is shown in purple on this slide. And the core can be, you know, flat, or it can grow into a, 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 a subtle um, geometry, or it can be quite visible, you know, kind of like really uh, mounded. Mud mounds, the cores can also aggregate. So you can have multiple mud mounds that aggregate and form a much larger mud mound complex. And often it's those complexes that are excellent reservoir for an end gas. There are also cases where the mud mound have flanks. So in that case, when flanks are important, you see the mound core in purple and the flanks in lighter purplish color. And those flanks often are composed of um, organisms that lived on the mud mound and at death rolled around the mud mound and formed the flanks. So the flanks often have a different lithology than the mud complex itself. So Mulshu Mound is located uh, in New Mexico and it was deposited during the Carboniferous. And in the Carboniferous, this was the edge of the continent here. It was actually in a relatively deep distal location at around several hundreds of meters of water depth. And Milsha Mound is one of a series of mud mounds that you find along this coastline. So it's not a unique um, occurrence. There is multiple of those um, mud mounds. And it's not completely clear what controls their, their formation. So it could be the presence of hydrothermal vents. It could be the presence of other nutrients. We don't really know, but we know that we have a series of mud mounds and we understand once they start forming, how they, uh, they continue. So let's look closely at Mulshu Mound. You see this beautiful mounded structure um, here and the flat top that I've already mentioned. 
Milchu mound can be divided into multiple cores. So we have a lower core, the central core, and a core on the right, and flanks. And if you look at the cores, of course, the cores are made of wax stone. So you see that big W, that's the wax stone. Fine grained lithology with fragment in it. That's the mud itself. The mud is produced by bacterial organism or algal or organism. And it is lithified early, which explains why we can keep those really steep geometries on, on the mud mound. But then also in the mud mound itself, there's a lot of porosity. In this case, it's being completely filled, but you see the big S here represents a stromatactis. The stromatactis is porosity typical of mud mound. And this stromatactis was completely filled with cement at Mulshu Mound, but in other mud mounds in the subsurface, it may not. And that's why these mud mound can be really interesting reservoirs. Now the flanks, like I said, are very different. And in the case of Milshu Mound, what we see is the flanks are made of the wax stone that we saw before, but also a lot of grain stone. And the grain stone are dominated by crinoids, which are indicated by letter C's here, and bryozoans. So again, those flanks, you know, could be potential good reservoirs. So that's why mud mounds are important in a reservoir context. And then at the very flank of the mud mound, because we have so much lithification, we also have the potential for breccia. And we have evidence here for breccia where you can see these blocks that are basically turned and mixed with the rest of the lithology. So these are brecciated lithology. So how do we form a mud mound like Mulshu Mound? Well, like I said, we are not completely clear because we don't have modern analogs to look at. However, we think that what probably happens is if you imagine that you have bryozoan and crinoids which are filtering organisms living on the seafloor these will tend to trap sediment and form a small mound the small mound is an interesting area to colonize once it's been stabilized because you're a bit higher in the water column which means that if you are filtering organisms it gives you an edge you're able to filter waters that other organisms can't um, access so the crinoids and the bryozoans will colonize that mound, thereby doing two things. A, trapping more sediments, so helping the growth of the mound, and B, also at their death, forming a flank. And as sea level is rising, or as the, um, the mud mound is rising, it becomes ever larger. Now, mud mounds can be reservoirs when there is a large volume of them and the porosity and permeability is good. Here's a photo from the Aneth field in Utah, and it is the largest oil producer in Utah, and it, it actually is an M factory mud mound. So the Aneth field is stopped by the uh, Gothic shale, which is the ultimate seal, and it contains dolomitized facies from mud mound. And again, the idea here is that we have multiple cores that coalesced to give you a large field. You can see the scale here is 10 miles. So this is a significant field. 